We've learned so much more from the DART mission. Dark oxygen is being generated at the bottom of the ocean. Starliner is almost ready to come home, and we might not need to dig deep to find life on Europa. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. NASA's DART mission crashed into asteroid Dimorphos in 2022, avenging the dinosaurs, but also teaching us what it might take to change the trajectory of a dangerous asteroid that could potentially crash with the Earth in the future. The DART mission went off without a hitch. It caused a pretty significant change to the orbital period of asteroid Dimorphos. Just remember, Didymus is the main asteroid, Dimorphos is the smaller moon. As it was on its way in and just about to impact with Dimorphos, it was recording tons of images and data. And then after the impact, astronomers were able to take a lot of telescope images of the pair and to be able to gain even more insights into what happened before and after the collision. And so this week we got a big collection of new papers published to the journal Nature, where they were discussing what was the outcome of a lot of the science. So we learned a bunch of things about Dimorphos and Didymus. And here are some highlights. The first thing is just to consider what is the source of this strange pair of asteroids. You've got this much larger Didymus, and then you've got this smaller moon Dimorphos. And it was Dimorphos that was the one that DART crashed into. And the surface of Didymus is a lot smoother, especially at the lower latitudes than Dimorphos is. Dimorphos has these big boulders across the surface. And so the thinking goes that at some point in the past, Didymus didn't have an asteroid companion. It was just a solo asteroid. It was struck, it got spun up, and then the debris from that collision collected into this smaller moon. Now we don't know exactly when this event happened, but it probably didn't happen a long time ago. So based on the DART observations, astronomers were able to estimate that the surface of Didymus is about 12 and a half million years old, while the surface of Dimorphos is only about 300,000 years old. So it's dramatically younger than the larger asteroid. One of the surprising outcomes of the DART mission was just how much they changed the period of Dimorphos's orbit. And now it looks like it's the composition of Dimorphos that caused that, that Dimorphos is just a collection of rocks of boulders. And so by slamming into it, it was able to transfer all of its momentum into Dimorphos. Additionally, it appears that Dimorphos didn't form just in one single event that probably formed over multiple events. So you can imagine a couple of possibilities. One is various objects slammed into Didymus, and the debris just continue to collect onto Dimorphos. The other possibility is that the the asteroid just spins up to the point that material starts to go into orbit around Didymus, transitions over to Dimorphos, then lands on the surface of Dimorphos, and then the rotation rate of Didymus slows down to the point that it's no longer, I don't know, shedding boulders. Probably the most interesting finding for me is that the surface of Dimorphos can't hold very much weight that if you tried to walk on the surface of Dimorphos, you would just fall inside like a ball pit. They calculated that the amount of weight that Dimorphos can withstand is about one one thousandth the amount that can be handled here on Earth on just like sand or even on lunar regolith. That if we tried to send a mission to soft land on Dimorphos, it would just slip down into the asteroid. Isn't there like a Simpsons episode with people stuck in the ball pit? I think so. A surprising source of oxygen at the bottom of the ocean. Even though fish live their entire lives in the water, they still breathe oxygen. They move forward, water passes along their gills, they're able to extract dissolved oxygen out of the water, and they're able to breathe with it. And you get a bunch of sources of this oxygen. You can have plants that are putting out oxygen into the water. You can have these interactions between the surface of the water and the atmosphere that mixes in water. But at the very deepest parts of the ocean, like thousands of meters below the surface, there are no plants, everything is completely dark, nothing grows. And yet there are concentrations of oxygen down there at the bottom of the ocean. So where is it coming from? So now researchers have figured out just an amazing source of where this deep oxygen they call dark oxygen is coming from. 
You might have heard of these strange metallic nodules that are down at the bottom of the ocean. These have formed over millions of years through just these very slow chemical processes. And if you get down to the very bottom of the ocean and you go along, you can see these nodules just sitting there on the surface. And in fact, there's a lot of people that are thinking about how, how can we make money? How can we mine these nodules? Because they're just big blobs of various kinds of metals that can be used in production, electric cars, things like that. And it turns out that these nodules, when they're sitting there on the surface, as they're interacting with the seawater, they act like natural batteries. Batteries. When you run electricity through water, you get electrolysis. The electricity is splitting up the water into hydrogen and oxygen gas, which then go up through the ocean. They found that there wasn't enough electricity for a single nodule, but when you had a couple of them touching together, they acted like a large enough battery to be able to produce this electrolysis effect. And so this idea is quite exciting for a bunch of reasons. But when you think about the search for life on extrasolar planets, we can think of situations where you would have oceans, land, and various things like Earth, but we can also imagine places that are extremely different from Earth. What about worlds where the oceans are tens of kilometers deep? And yet we could potentially have a source of oxygen that is feeding it into the water. And so it could improve the prospects for life down at the bottom of these oceans. And so we've got another way that life could find a way on these extrasolar planets. And the other thing that I mentioned is that a lot of mining companies are thinking about how they could mine these nodules off the bottom of the seafloor. And they take millions of years to be created. And so they're not a renewable resource. If it turns out that they are what's responsible for providing oxygen to the deepest depths of the ocean, that could be a problem. And so maybe we should think more carefully before we start mining them. Kepler's drawings of the sun. Johannes Kepler was one of the astronomers who were responsible for our sort of modern understanding of the universe. And he did a lot of amazing research. We've got spacecraft named after Kepler. And one of the things that he did was he took incredibly accurate measurements of the sky including the sun. And he did this before he got his hands on a telescope. He used a thing called a camera obscura where you put a pinpoint hole in a dark room, and then you allow the light to come through the hole and then it sort of projects the light onto a surface. And then he was able to see the sun in incredible detail. He's able to draw a very accurate version of the sun showed where all of the different sunspot groups were. And based on that astronomers were able to calculate which solar cycle Kepler was observing. Now we are in solar cycle 25. And there's this 11 year cycle where the sun goes from its solar maximum to its minimum and back again. And the first cycle was in 1755. That's when astronomers first noticed the cycle started to keep track of the amount of sunspots. And they consider that to be one we're in 25. And so based on the drawings from Kepler, they were able to pinpoint that he was drawing that in solar cycle negative 13. In other words, 13 solar cycles before the measurements were started. And this is actually really interesting because it is just before a very interesting period of solar activity called the Maunder minimum when there was a reduced amount of sunspot activity. Starliner and SpaceX updates. So do you remember Starliner? That was that mission from Boeing that flew two astronauts to the International Space Station. They were supposed to be there for a week and they have been there for months. When are they going to come home? Well, probably pretty soon. NASA has been doing a bunch of tests with Boeing where they've been trying to go through the problems, figure out the helium leaks that were in their propulsion system, also figure out some of its malfunctioning thrusters. And they did a recent hot fire test with the capsule attached to the International Space Station. They were able to fire 27 of its 28 thrusters, which is good. And they also found that the helium pressure inside the spacecraft was nominal what they were expecting. So right now we really don't know what the state of Starliner is going to be. Uh, it could be that by the time we do next week's show, they will have returned. It could be that NASA will have made the call and to bring them home on a Crew Dragon instead. So we'll keep you posted on what happens with Starliner. And then we should talk about SpaceX. And so a couple of weeks ago, there was a failed launch of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The first stage booster went fine, but it was the upper stage that failed and that marooned a flight 
of Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit, they're not going to be able to have the propulsion to get to their desired orbit, and they're all going to re enter the Earth's atmosphere, which is fine. like SpaceX has got a million Starlinks, so I'm sure they're they're fine with that. But the problem was that the FAA wanted an investigation wanted SpaceX to figure out what the problem was. SpaceX investigated the problem and they were able to narrow it down to a sensor line for its liquid oxygen fuel system. It's probable that during the launch, the vibration caused like a loose part of this sense line to break. And then that led to the failure of the upper stage. But according to SpaceX, they don't need this sensor line that they have redundant systems that can actually perform the same function. And so they're going to fly without having to run that sensor line. And that was acceptable to the FAA. And so SpaceX already has gotten back to flights. So that's just like a manifestation of SpaceX's saying, you know, the best part is no part. So it turns out they didn't need that part. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the most interesting space news story. And the winner was the discovery by perseverance of a very interesting rock on Mars, the kind of rock that we would find on Earth that would be produced by life. And so is this the strongest indication that perseverance has found evidence of life on Mars? Who knows, we're going to need those samples to know for sure. Now, every week we post the new vote to the community tab here on our channel within about 24 hours of when we post Space Bites. And so if you want, if you're just scrolling through and you see the vote, just take a second. Let us know what you think. Of course, the best chance to see the vote is click on subscribe on our channel, watch a bunch of our videos, and that will train the algorithm to show you our polls each week. We don't have to dig deep on Europa. Europa and Enceladus are two ice moons here in the solar system, and they are two of the most exciting places to search for evidence of life in the solar system. Obviously, the ideal would be to dig through tens of kilometers of ice to get down to the liquid oceans underneath and be able to sample this water directly, but that's going to be really tricky. But instead, what if we landed on the surface of either of those worlds, dug down into the surface, and just searched for evidence of organic molecules? There are a lot of really interesting chemicals that make up life, amino acids, other kinds of chemicals that are seen with life, either the building blocks used by life or the byproducts produced by life. You can find either of those. It's very interesting. But we know that being exposed to space is an incredibly hazardous environment. You've got the high energy cosmic rays, you've got the solar wind coming from the sun. And if you're going to be around Jupiter, you've got the trapped radiation in its magnetosphere. These combine to make an incredible lethal radioactive environment for any life on the surface of Europa or Enceladus. But water is an incredible protector against radiation. We always talk about how if you had like a meter of water between you and space, you would be protected from all of that radiation. But it actually is a lot more complicated than that. You've got to think about whether you're on the trailing side of the world or the leading side of the world, whether you've got areas that are fully exposed to space or places that have been churned up by micrometeorite hits. And so researchers recently investigated how deep you would have to dig to be able to get at the organic compounds, amino acids, to have evidence for the building blocks of life on a place like Europa. They found that you would only have to go down in some cases just a couple of millimeters, and you would be able to have pristine enough samples that you could know whether or not you had those building blocks of life. Anything right on the surface is going to be damaged by the radiation, but you don't have to go very deep. So let's go. I got a couple of cool videos to share with you today. First, we've got a super slow motion of Starship firing its engines on a hot fire test is going to be the Starship that will be part of the fifth test of the Starship Super Heavy stack. We've already seen the hot fire test of the Super Heavy booster. So now we've got a hot fire test of Super Heavy Starship. Let's put them together. Let's fly them to space. We've been enjoying the updates from the Astroscale Address J mission. This is this small Japanese mission that is designed to approach and rendezvous and fly around a piece of space junk. And we've shown you images closer and closer and closer as the spacecraft has gotten close to this H2 rocket upper stage. And now it's come within 50 meters and is now flying around the space debris, taking pictures of it from every angle. Now, 
Address J is not going to actually rendezvous with the piece of space junk. Its job is to just demonstrate the technology, but then this is going to be a pathfinder for a future mission that will then actually fly up, do the same thing as Address J, but actually grab on to the piece of space junk and then deorbit it. But it's just amazing that this is actual video or actual photographs of a piece of space junk in space. Now you're watching Space Bites right now, but what I'm doing is writing my weekly email newsletter. This is where I gather together all of the stories that we're covering on Universe Today and send it out to 70,000 of my best friends. I'll just give you a sample of some of the stories that we're covering in the newsletter that we're not covering here on the video. For example, Astronomers think they've found the missing link between stellar and supermassive black holes. A new study shows how the sun could permanently capture rogue planets. And a time when the Earth might have had polar moons shortly after the impact that created the moon. I send out my weekly email newsletter on Fridays, and it is completely ad free. I write every word you can unsubscribe anytime you like. So just go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. Now I'm going to talk about the state of Universe Today, which is the company that I run and our plans for the future. And so if you're not into that, if you don't really care about who actually produces all of this news, now would be the time to leave because we're going to get into the weeds. But if you do want to stick around, first, I'm going to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Gross, Bill, David Giltanen, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Modso, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I've talked quite a bit about sort of what Universe Today has been going through and the decrease in advertising revenue that we've been seeing, and it is continuing. I mean, at this point, we get about 10% of the advertising revenue on the Universe Today website website that we did uh, several years ago. And there's all kinds of reasons why this is happening. You've got sort of more and more content being absorbed by the social media companies, you've got AI doing things, you've got Google no longer sending as much search traffic, there's a lot of reasons. But seeing that the writing was on the wall years ago, I tried to shift the way we run our business so that we're supported by the fans by the patrons, and not supported by advertising. And this is a slow incremental change. But because of this, we haven't had to make any changes in the way we run our news on Universe Today. If anything, I think we're a lot better than we were a few years ago. And this is the plan. The goal is within the next couple of years, I hope we can get rid of advertising completely. And we're just fully sustained by the patrons. And then we have a direct relationship to the people who want to be able to consume this news. And there are a lot of different ways that we can make revenue. Obviously, we could do sponsorship ads, there's all kinds of VPNs and, and health services that we could be promoting here in our videos. And we don't do any of that. We don't show any of the mid roll ads in the many of our videos, like we really try to minimize the amount of advertising that you have to deal with. And that is thanks to the patrons who support the work that we do. I don't like ads. And I know that you don't like ads. And yet I need to pay the salaries of the people who write the words on the website who are producing the videos that you're watching and doing the audio production programming, the development behind the scenes for what we do. So I need to be able to pay people salaries. I, I'm so excited at the possibility that we could just be supported by the fans and not by advertisers, they don't really care about space. I mean, they're looking to just get in front of as many eyeballs as they can. Now, if you are Patreon curious, and you're not sure if you just want to become a patron, you want to just sort of get a sense of what that's like, you can always follow our patron feed completely for free on Patreon, just go to patreon.com slash universe today. And there should be right away a way to sign up for free. And then you'll get all the different announcements that we make via Patreon, you get all the stuff that is available to everybody in the public. And then you can always switch over to become a paid Patreon, if that ever is something that you want to do. So this is the plan. I think we're going to pull it off. If you want to come and join this movement, go to patreon.com slash universe today. And we all thank you in advance. All right, we'll see you next week.